Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 13, he says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, being being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, and giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. In this section, Paul is coming back to his conversation about the prayers that he is um, uh, praying for them. In verse three, he had started this conversation by saying, we haven't ceased to give thanks for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, your love for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. In the following verses, he started to expound on what that hope was that was laid up for them in heaven, how the gospel was bearing fruit and increasing all over the world and in Colossae as well, and then about the ministry of Epaphras. Here in verse 9, he comes back to these things that he's praying for them. And I want to pay attention to the things he's praying for them, because if he thought it was important enough to pray for them, then that probably means it's important for us as well, that we should be praying these things for ourselves and in the lives of the people around us who are also believers. And we should be striving for these things in our own lives. These are things that are important. Because this section is so important, I want to not take it apart, but I want to look at it as a whole, um, but we can't do that in one 15 minute Bible study. And so um, what I want to do is just cover the major points in this passage, and then we'll come back to the first one and we'll spend the rest of the time in there. And so what Paul's praying, he says, we have not ceased to pray for you. And the first thing he says is that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Okay. And so he's asking God that they may understand his will. He's praying for them to understand the will of God. Okay. But why is he praying this? Well, he says he's praying this so as to, so that they may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him. Okay, and so um, the, the point that Paul's making is that he is praying for them to understand God's will because he wants them to be able to walk in a manner fully pleasing to the Lord and uh, worthy of the Lord, and that they can't do that unless they first understand what God's will is. What are the things that please him? What are the things that displease him? What are his expectations? Okay, once they understand that, then they're able to walk in a manner fully pleasing to him. Okay, so then he begins to describe those things that are, what that looks like. How, what are those things that are pleasing to him? He says, bearing fruit in every good work is the first one. Secondly, increasing in the knowledge of God. Third, was being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy. And the fourth was giving thanks to the Father. The last part of the verse, he, the, the passage, he says, um, he begins to tell us the things for the reasons why we should be thankful to the Father. And so he says, um, he has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. We'll talk about what that means. And finally, he says, um, he's delivered us from the domain of darkness and he's transferred us into the kingdom of his son in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. Okay, but let's go back up to verse nine and just start in this first thing that Paul is praying for them, that they may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. We already talked about why um, in order for us to walk in a manner pleasing to the Lord or walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, we need to first understand what God's will is. We need to know his will. We need to understand what his expectations are. What does he require of us, okay? Um, this is this is the first thing that we need to do in order to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Okay, but then the question is, how? How is it that we can walk, in, I'm sorry, how is it that we can understand what God's will is? How do we know what God's will is? How are we filled with that knowledge? Um, as I was thinking about this, the three uh, main things that came to mind were the word of God, the second would be prayer, and the third is being filled with the spirit of God. And so let's just start in the very first one, um, the word of God. Um, we know in the Bible, it says that thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In other words, the word of God is the thing that lights the way before us. It lets us and sets us on a path um, to following God. Okay. We know in, um, in the Bible talks about that there's a narrow path and there's a wide road. The narrow path leads to life. The wide road leads to destruction. And many are they that are going to go that way. Only few are going to find the narrow path. It talks about the gate to that road. The gate is Jesus himself and that you have to go through the gate through Jesus in order to get on that narrow path. Well, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And so God's word, God's word is his self-revelation to humanity. Every word of the Bible tells us who God is. Um, what are the things that please him? What are the things that displease him? What is his nature? What is his character? How um, did he create us? And, and how did he create us to relate to him? In what ways have we failed him? How has he redeemed us? And what are his requirements and expectations of us as his creatures? Okay, yeah, this is something, um, being in his word, um, this is something that God has really impressed upon me the last year that he really wants me to focus on. He said, immerse yourself in my word. Just pour it into your soul. Pour it into your mind. Pour it into your spirit. Bring all your thoughts and your affections and your desires and your emotions. Bring them into alignment with my own. Okay, the word of God is how we understand God. 
and who he is and what his will is in a conceptual and intellectual and theological way. Um, but God's word also is powerful. The Bible says it's living and active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It says, um, he says in um, the Bible, he says, so is my word that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me void, but it will always accomplish the purpose for which I have sent it. Okay, but the word, the word of God can change us. It can mold us and shape us and make us like him. It can produce a harvest in our life, but how much of a harvest it produces depends upon the condition of our heart as well. Um, the parable of the sower says a sower goes out to seed. Some uh, sow seed, some falls by the wayside, some falls in the thorns, some falls um, in the, the rocky soil and others falls in the good soil, right? And so we, we see those four different types of soil, um, those are the conditions of the human heart. If it falls by the wayside, the birds come and just eat it. It never has a chance to take root. If it falls on the rocky soil, the, the, it falls in rocky soil. It's too shallow. It puts down roots, starts to grow up, but then it withers. And the one that falls among thorns, it, it grows up too, but then it gets choked out by the other uh, thorns and stuff that are around it. And so um, that represents those that get more concerned with the making money and the concerns of the world than they are about God and that their faith just withers. Um, and then some falls on the good soil. And we should be asking God, Help the word, the, the, the soil of my heart to be fertile and good soil. Um, remove the rocks, remove the thorns. Help, help my heart not to be hard like the wayside. Help it to be soft and fertile and ready to receive that it might produce your harvest in my life. So the word of God is the first way that we can understand God and what his will is for us on this earth. Um, the second way is prayer. Prayer is communion with God. It is communication with God. It's intimacy with God. Prayer is dialogue with God. It's not monologue. Um, and if it is monologue, it should be God monologuing to us, not the other way around. In prayer, we get to know God as our Father, okay? God is our Father, and just like we human mothers and fathers desire intimacy and connection and closeness and oneness with our children, so our Father desires that intimacy with us, and we desire it with Him, and we need to ask Him to help us to desire Him more. In this time of prayer, we speak, yes, but we also listen. We ask for things, but we also sit and wait to receive. Um, in prayer, oftentimes, this is where God will give us a very specific will to our life. I want you to go um, and talk to that person and tell them about me. I want you to begin to pray for the person over there. They may not even know it. Call that person you haven't talked to in 10 years. Um, and, and then we do, and we find out there was a reason why God told us to do that. He might give us specific um, direction according to his will in a bigger thing. You know, I want you to begin to sow toward doing this ministry. Um, I want you to reach out to that people group. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of that that can come in that time of prayer. But if we don't do it, we won't receive it. We have to sit in his presence, wait upon him, listen, speak thanks, give him thanks, give him praise, speak and listen, receive and give. Um, this is relationship. This is interactional time with our God. The difference between the word and prayer is the word is knowing about God. And in the word changes us, yes, but prayer is not just knowing about God, it's knowing Him, knowing God. The difference between knowing a famous person um, and reading all about their life and watching all their movies and actually knowing them as their child, then living with them, being loved by them and loving them in return. That's the difference between the word and prayer, okay? And so um, the third way, the first way is word, the second way prayer, and the third way that we can know the will of God and know Him is by being filled with the spirit of the living God. In Acts chapter one, Jesus tells the disciples to wait in Jerusalem. He says, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. See, God's design for us to live this life on this earth is to live it empowered by his Holy Spirit, to, to live it empowered by the spirit that is within him. In other words, um, just as Jesus, took the death that we deserve, so were we supposed to live the life that he deserved, right? And he is to be able to live that through us. There's a there's a passage in the, in the New Testament that says that I am crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but this life that I live in the flesh, I live that life by faith in the Son of God. Um, God's design for us as believers is to live a life that is in communion and oneness with him through his spirit that is within us, empowered by him, to live for him on this earth. In Ephesians chapter five, Paul says, therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of God is. Don't be drunk with wine, which is debauchery, but be filled with the spirit. In second Corinthians, Paul says in chapter six, or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You've been bought with a price, believer. And this is the same example that Jesus gave us on his earthly ministry. When he, everything he did, he gave credit to the Father. Okay, everything he did, 
in power, whether it be casting out demons, healing the sick, preaching words of power, speaking words of wisdom and knowledge, supernatural things, um, feeding the 5,000. Everything he did came from a place of intimacy with God, deep intimacy with God's word, and um, being filled with the presence of the Father himself. The Father was in him. In, in, um, in chapter 12 of John, Jesus says this, I've not spoken of my own authority, but the Father who sent me, he has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. In John chapter 5, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. And you know, Jesus prayed the same thing for us in John chapter 17. He prayed in John chapter 17 for us to be one. He says, Just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you've sent me. This is the glory that I, that you've given me. I've given it to them that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. And so this is the way that Jesus desires us, his church, to live and interact with one another um, on this earth and with him. Okay. The, we are filled at salvation and justification with the spirit of the living God. Okay, and, and later on um, in this chapter, Colossians um, chapter one, Paul's going to say about Christ, in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile all things to himself. He says, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in Jesus Christ. Okay, this imagery is the imagery of the temple. Um, in Solomon's day, David had saved up all the materials and set them all aside and drew up all the plans and gave instructions for how the temple was to be built. But God chose Solomon to build it for him. And Solomon did build the temple and he completed it. And everything was set in place and everything was cleansed by the sprinkling of blood. And on that day, all the elders were there and all the people were there and Solomon was there and the priesthood was there and they were worshiping the Lord all as one and so many animals were being sacrificed on the altar that they lost count of them and then it says in second chronicles the house of the Lord was filled with the cloud so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God Jesus is the temple Jesus is the house of God and all the fullness of God is pleased to dwell in his temple and we as his body are saved into his body and are being built into a temple a dwelling place for the Spirit of God, which Ephesians chapter 2 says. And we don't understand this as we should. We think of the Holy Spirit as like this little helping force. No, it's God. He is God in us. And, and later on in this chapter, verse 27 of Colossians, Paul's going to say, this is the mystery revealed now to us in the last days. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Like the Holy Spirit is not some ethereal force that gives us power to be good and not sin. The Holy Spirit is God. Christ dwells in you, the hope of glory. Okay, as believers, God dwells in you. Okay, Christ dwells in you. The whole fullness of God dwells in him, and he dwells in you by his spirit. And what better way for us to be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, than being filled by his very presence, by his spirit, the spirit in us, Christ in us through his spirit and the fullness of God, pleased to dwell within Christ. Us made one with the Holy Trinity and that the, the death that he bore for us, we now give him our life and he lives his life through us on this earth. It, it says it in Ezekiel, right? In the last days, I'm going to put my spirit upon you and I'm going to cause you to walk in my statutes and obey my commands. That day is this day and that spirit is his spirit. It is within us. The spirit the Son and the Father dwelling with us in perfect unity and bringing us and drawing us into this unity. We can pray for him to so fully, fully fill us, so completely fill us that all darkness, all thoughts, all affections, all desires that are not of him begin to just be pushed and purged out of us. That every thought, every everything comes into alignment, that he softens our heart to be sensitive to his spirit, that we might be led by him, that we might hear his voice and be directed into the good works which he's prepared beforehand, that we should walk in in them. Paul said, we have not ceased to pray for you that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and all understanding so as to walk in a manner fully pleasing to the Lord. Um, and, and, and we seek his will. We seek to know his will. We seek to understand his will through immersing ourselves in the word of God, through going and spending time with him in intimate prayer, giving, receiving, speaking, and hearing, and by being filled with the very spirit of the living 
God, the Holy Trinity, living and dwelling within us and manifesting his life through us on this earth, right? I've been crucified with Christ. In the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God.